Today, I will introduce you to Ursula K. Le Guin. Of course, you already know her. So I am going to introduce you to parts of her work that you probably do not know, unknown Ursula. When talking about Le Guin's utopianism, her novel The Dispossessed comes to mind firstly. It is what Tom Moylan and others have labeled a critical utopia because it is so non-perfectionist and not at all like former classical utopias. If you look for more Utopia by Le Guin, you may also find her novel Always Coming Home, which is, I would say, an even more critical Utopia. In fact, Le Guin herself has criticized her first Utopian novel as not being radical, critical and subversive enough in her famous essay A Non-Euclidean View as of California as a Cold Place to Be. All this is extremely interesting and some members of the Anarchist Studies Network, including me, have done and presented research on these texts. But today I want to look somewhere else in Le Guin's oeuvre. I want to look at texts that do not fully but partially match the definition of utopia. According to Lyman Tower Sargent, a positive utopia is a non-existent society described in considerable detail and normally located in time and space that the author intended a contemporaneous reader to view as considerably better than the society in which that reader lived. The novels that dispossessed and always coming home match this and other definitions, but there is more. Le Guin has also written what I call homeo-utopias that deviate from the definition. Micro-utopias are not full societies. Hemi-utopias are not fully non-existent, so that parts of the fictional society resemble our own. Fictional ethnographies depict radically alternative societies but do not valuate them as good or bad. And pre-utopias tell the prehistory of a utopia without talking about utopia itself. Additionally to the homeo-utopias there are what I call hyper-utopias that are not necessarily utopian themselves but they tell us something about utopia nonetheless. I invented these categories after reading much of Le Guin's fictional opus, but I did not I did only look at science fiction texts of all lengths. I omitted fantasy, alternative history, children books, poems and non-fictional texts. Still, there are many, many short stories and novels that deserve the attention of the utopian's color. See this exhaustive list. Of course, I cannot talk about every uh, story here, but maybe some examples of homeo and hyper utopias will do. Le Guin's homeo utopias appear in different forms. The first, furthest from full utopia are texts in which only small groups and their cooperation are described. I call them micro-utopias. An example of this would be the short story Nine Lives, a small community of ten people who know no conflicts among them, uh, among themselves because as clones they are all identical. One would also have to include the teams of ice hikers in The Left Hand of Darkness and Sir among the micro-utopias because it is their communality that enables them to overcome the geographical and meteorological obstacles. The term also applies to the spaceship crews in The Showbiz Story and Dancing to Ganam, who's, who each attempt to harmonize particularly well with one another but ultimately fail. Micro-utopias are not fully-fledged utopias because they lack population and sovereignty. The community formed in each case does not have itself or the coexistence of its members as its goal, but rather a purpose that is usually set from the outside 
and is also conceived from the outset as being limited in time. In the best case, this can lead to successful teamwork. If things do not go so well, there are differences, disputes and divisions. While microutopias cannot serve as models for complete societies, Le Guin makes it quite clear which forms of community she considers desirable and which she considers stupid or insane. She even portrays some teams as downright evil. Le Guin rejects all communities that are based on violence and hierarchies and are outwardly aggressive, for example Captain Davidson's troop in The World for World is Forest. Most of the spaceship crews uh, of the Ecumen, which is uh, Le Guin's uh, science fictional um, um, franchise, um, most of these spaceship crews are much more sympathetic. There is a division of labor, yes, but no hierarchies. In order for the crew to become a community, there is a process of getting to know each other and growing together, sometimes lasting weeks before the launch. It is called Isyeye, that is an invented word defined in the short story The Shobis Story. Quote, the word is Heinisch and means making a beginning together or beginning to be together or used technically the period of time and area of space in which a group forms if it is going to form. A honeymoon is an Isyeye of two." End quote. Responsibility is shared and if problems arise, solutions are sought jointly and as consensually as possible through discussions. The mini-societies, portrayed by Le Guin as sympathetic and worthy of imitation, are peaceful. Their basically anarcho-pacifist communality is of course no guarantee for functional efficiency. In particular, Interpersonal feelings and emotional sensitivities can disturb the balance that is so positively valued as, for example, described particularly clearly in Vaster Than Empires and More Slow. While the microutopias are too small and dependent to be complete utopias, another type of homeo utopias lacks the description of important areas of social life. These texts are only half utopias, therefore I call them Hemi utopias. They lack holistic solutions and deal with only one or a few problems. And Le Guin's best known positive Hemi utopias are, of course, the left hand of darkness and the word for world is forest. In The Left Hand of Darkness, two complete societies are presented, but they only differ a so offer a solution to real-world problems in the dimension of gender or sexism. As far as the political system, the economy or environmental destruction are concerned, the novel is silent or only offers the old familiar. This is similar in the novella The Word for World is Forest. The topics discussed here are ecology and pacifism, while one learns little or nothing about the educational system and the economy, for example. In the Hemi Utopias, Le Guin deals with themes that move her, without having to come up with complete societies for each. The critique of the real world is always easy to identify. The societies described are clearly evaluated. Frequently, however, Le Guin refuses to evaluate the society she describes. Whether in the descriptions of alternative societies in the first three Heinisch novels from the 1960s, or in the stories of the 1990s, which mainly describe marriage rules and sexuality, we seem to be dealing with ethnographic reports in each case. Le Guin neither adds a 
not like that to these social images, nor does she paint them as models to be imitated. Here she is simply a writer who is not so much bound to story skeletons and plots, but concentrates more on landscapes, moods and indeed societies. Le Guin's approach is usually that of a thought experiment. What comes out of it looks quite similar to her utopian designs, which is why these are also homeo-utopias. But it is not intended as a utopia, so I do not call it blah 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 utopia, but fictional ethnography. I asked Le Guin about the similarity of many of her texts to utopias. Here is her answer. I quote from a letter she wrote to me in 2005. Quote, I am quite aware that I tend to invent worlds whose society resembles ours in some ways and varies intensely from it in others. I see these as a kind of anthropology of the imagination, an exploration of possible alternative ways of living as human beings, but not as utopias or dystopias, good places or bad places. Alternatives is the keyword here, perhaps? End quote. Yeah, that was indeed a letter from Ursula. The fictional ethnographies are thus not completely apolitical. The fact that she invents alternatives to the well-known systems of patriarchy, heterosexuality, capitalism, monotheism, hierarchy, militarism and heroism shows the readers that their way of life and their form of society are not the only possible ones. The fact that this fiction refrains from moralizing and does not present the alternative society as the only correct one may have a more subversive effect than a political program that clearly states which solutions to which problems are being sought. The last group of utopia-like texts are the pre-utopias, in which the way to the establishment of a utopia is described. For example, the short story The Day Before the Revolution tells us about Odo and her role in the revolution that sparked the anarchist society described in the novel The Dispossessed. For the utopia always coming home, no pre-utopias exist. There are some texts that could be classified as pre-utopias if one knew, knew uh, whether the corresponding actions of the characters lead to their utopian goal. These are stories that describe social upheavals but are silent about the success or consequences. The first isolated pre-utopia is The Eye of the Huron. It describes the social conflict that leads to a small group of settlers moving into the isolation of the wilderness to found a community that lives, that lives out their ideals of nonviolence, solidarity and grassroots democracy. Readers do not find out whether this attempt to found a pacifist utopia is successful. The rock that changed things also a short, short story, also ends before the happy ending. The new robles, one group of characters in this story, these new robles strive for a paradigm shift in the interpretation of society constituting texts, which are patterns of stone terraces in this story, and therefore instigate a violent uprising. Uh, uprising. Whether the socially constructed difference between obels and new obels can be abolished, thus ending the domination of some over others, that is, whether the utopia of freedom is achieved, is not uh, uh, in the short story. In the matter of Zachary, violent riots occur because of the brutal oppression of men by other men. These eventually trigger a new law that gives men the freedom to move outside the castles and fuckeries, 
almost as if they were women who are free all the time. But this does not make Zachary a utopia by any means. Men have not one recognition with their freedom. The planet still has many reforms and developments ahead of it before its society loses its, loses its dystopian character. And these changes are not at all guaranteed. The most utopia-like pre-utopia is probably Paradise's Lost. Uh, you find this um, novella in the book The Birthday of the World and Other Stories. In this novella, the creation of a utopia is described in detail. The social institutions in the Generation Starship Discovery sound like an ideal state from the very beginning. But they do not add up to a utopia because the people living in it are only a means to an end. They are actually only the carriers for the genes from which the settlers of the new earth are to emerge. They are conceded to live well, and to that extent the spaceship is not only a prison but also a good place. However, a paradigm shift is again necessary in order to become sovereign. The, support, the supporters of a sect named Bliss reinterpret the original purpose of the journey as an end in itself and thus, for the time being, successfully create a utopia. As a means to this end, they use a religion tailor-made for the situation and they destroy information about the earlier destination. Paradise is Lost is not a utopia, but only a pre-utopia, because the setting of the narrative leaves the ship at the very moment it becomes utopia. Thus, it is even doubtful whether the utopia that has been fought for is at all as desirable as the previous dependent proto-utopia. This is a fundamental question in Le Guin's utopianism. Is Utopia really good? What makes Utopia bad? In her homier Utopias and homier Dystopias, Le Guin shows us good and bad aspects of fictional societies. But in some of them, she discusses fundamental questions of Utopianism as such. I call them hyper-Utopias, texts that tell us something about Utopia. There are even two hyper-utopias that more or less lack any utopian descriptions. The Lathe of Heaven and SQ. In both, doctors have very good intentions, get immense power and ruthlessly make their utopian goals real, which results in the misery or death of billions of humans. In the novel The Lathe of Heaven, Dr. Haber wants to get rid of overpopulation, racism, war, climate catastrophe and an alien attack while making the humans healthier. He uses one of his patients as a tool. This tool, named George Orr, is not well. But he can dream so effectively that his dreams become reality. So Dr. Haber lets Orr dream a better world into being with catastrophic effects. In the short story SQ, Dr. Speakey finds out that almost all humans are crazy and sends them in re-education camps, so in the end everyone is a prisoner, including Dr. Speakey himself. But there is no effective therapy. I understand these two stories as parables for the nature of the world to resist overly radical and voluntaristic planning and to elude the purity of utopian realization intent. In the hyperutopias The Lathe of Heaven and SQ, Le Guin attacks the illusion of feasibility that accompanies the realization intention of many or at least some utopias. In doing so, she draws on Taoist wisdom, according to which the course of things, the Tao, cannot be abandoned. The path is the goal, which is why the means must be compatible with the end.
Whereas in these two stories, Le Guin criticizes the hybris of utopists, she warns about the ignorance of utopists in two other stories, Pathways of Desire and Newton's Sleep. In Pathways of Desire, a young man, Will Copman, who is frustrated with his fears and his lack of sexual intercourse, daydreams of a society full of adventure, sex and courage. Unbeknownst to him, his dreams become reality on a very distant planet. Because of his limited perspective, the planet is culturally very poor. Only the people that he forgets to think about, the old people, can free themselves of his stupid fantasies and create a rich language and culture. Now, Will Cupman is not dumber than any of us. Le Guin's parable fits every utopist because no one can see all perspectives. Therefore, a perfect plan that puts everyone on their place must fail. In the short story Newton's Sleep, the utopist is a strict rationalist, Ike Rose. He designed a space station that is very clean and should free its inhabitants from all the dirt of Earth. But humans cannot fit in sterile compartments and be just good. Ike Rose is shocked that the children on the space station start to use anti-Semitic anti -Semitic slurs, which should be impossible. He thought he had wiped out this irrationality from the past, but humans are irrational, and sometimes they are even vile. No utopian plan can make humans perfectly good and rid them from baseness and envy. Wherever humans go, they take the Earth's dirt with them. This is also a major theme in the hyperutopia Paradise is Lost, where Utopia also seems to be a sterile spaceship, but Le Guin clearly favors those that leave the ship and try to live on a new Earth, in new dirt with new problems. Perfection is impossible, and utopists that strive for perfection are as ignorant as the adolescent Will Copman, even if they are extremely rational. For Le Guin, the habitu uh, habitability of utopias is an important issue. For a form of society to be, to be desired, it must be a society of people, that is, it must allow for human actions, feelings, relationships, etc. Don't get me wrong, Le Guin does not think that antisemitism and pathogenic germs are necessary, no. But she is sure that sterility is not viable and that, after all, we are part of nature, not part of a plan. In the short satirical section of the second report of the shipwrecked foreigner to the Cadan of Derb, which reports on the practical problems one gets into when trying to live in a two-dimensional blueprint, a literal blueprint, Le Guin pokes fun at the unfruitful attempts of utopians to squeeze people into their perfect plans. Now I skip the short story The Rock That Changed, changed Things, we had that already, because I would need to explain Gustav Landauer's theory of revolution to have an interpretive frame for it, <clears throat> and I'm already speaking too long, I know. So let's have a look at my final example, the short story The Ones Who Walk Away From Omelas. This is the most hyper-utopian fictional text of Le Guin. It describes a utopian society without giving too many details. Every reader can fantasize about their own wishes and ideals. But this utopia has one flaw. To remain good and to guarantee the happiness of the citizens, one child has to suffer. Thus, the price of utopia is too high. It is true that Le Guin shows understanding for the Omelasians who are willing to sacrifice the child, just as she does not portray Dr. Haber, Copman and the angels on the uh, starship Discovery as evil. But she stresses that there are choices. 
One can leave Omelas if one has the specific and uncommitted sense that such pleasure is abhorrent, deliberately acquired at the expense of even a single lost soul. The title characters of the story turn their backs on this utopia and Le Guin is with them. But they do not abandon utopia at all. Maybe they start a new utopian society elsewhere, maybe even an anarchist one on Anaris. Well, what do we learn from Le Guin's homeo-utopias and hyper-utopias? The homeo-utopias, on the one hand, give us a glimpse of Le Guin's political outlook. She describes a wide variety of social conditions and events in a way that is tantamount to a direct valuation. Le Guin rejects violence, militarism, hierarchies, environmental degradation, racism, fundamentalism, intellectual limitation and sexism. Where such phenomena prevail, she usually allows rebels or counter-movements to appear. At the very least, however, she depicts the suffering of victims and generates disgust in her readers through pity. She favors consensus-based decision-making without hierarchies. She also favors non-violence and responsible freedom. To this end, she repeatedly emphasizes the interconnectedness of people both with each other and with their environment and tradition. In the Homer Utopias, Le Guin reveals herself as a pacifist, feminist and Taoist, whereby all three isms are strongly influenced by anarchism. The hyper-utopias, on the other hand, allow us to take a look at Le Guin's attitude towards utopias. This attitude initially seems to be a very critical one. Firstly, utopian perfection cannot be achieved and secondly, not all means may be used to achieve it. Again and again, Le Guin deals with the futility of finding a perfect solution to all problems through rational planning that does not only look good on paper. By turning utopias into reality, one enters a realm that is not fully available to man. The hyper-utopias are images of Le Guin's view that neither nature can be controlled nor man shaped in the way that would be necessary for the utopians' total concepts. But if one cannot freely dispose of nature and human beings in order to mold them into a suitable form, then perfection is absolutely unattainable. As I stated in the beginning, non-perfectionist utopia is what Le Guin is renowned for. She wrote two of them. I claim that a thorough reading of her lesser-known science fiction texts, especially the Homia and Hyperutopias, helps to understand the non-perfectionism of her utopianism. And that's it from me. Thank you for listening to me.